Hello and welcome to another RTAF podcast episode. My guest this week is Justin Aversano. Justin is the co-founder of a really cool project called Save Art Space, a nonprofit that buys billboard space and replaces images used for advertising with public art from local artists. We talk a lot about that project, its genesis, the philosophy behind it, the impact of public art. We also talk about his photography book, Twin Flames. We talk about how technology is influencing art and how art is influencing technology. Why society tells people they can't be an artist, whether everyone is an artist, and a whole lot more. If you're looking to get involved in Save Art Space, go to their website, saveartspace.org, and submit your art. It's only $10 per image for a chance to have your work on a billboard or public advertising space. You can also donate there if you're not submitting work and you just want to support the cause. As always, thank you for listening. And if you would like to support the podcast, go snag yourself a hoodie or maybe a t-shirt or maybe a mug. They all have the RCAF logo on there. And you can get that at www.motif.com slash rtaf that is motif spelled m-o-t-e-e-f-e dot com slash rtaf all one word let's jump right into it here we go here we go being on the podcast i appreciate it just kind of yeah it was really cool to hear you talk about save art space in clubhouse and uh yeah this is a good faith meeting between people who have never actually met so uh i'm excited for it man thank you thank you for inviting me let's get artsy as fuck on your podcast man (laughs) yeah dude um well yeah welcome on and um Let's see. Let's just jump right into it, man. Can you talk about Save Art Space? I'm sure you can. And I will happily talk about Save Art Space. Just go Where would you like to start? From the beginning? From the end? Yeah. I, <laughs> those are <laughs> both very valid places to start. Um, could Would you mind just giving us kind of the backstory that led you to this career path? Because I think that would be really interesting. The backstory is the funniest story, actually. Awesome. <laughs> so I love when people want to know about that because it's actually a really funny thing. So I went to SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York City, mm-hmm. uh, from 2010 to 2014. Um, during that time, I spent you know learning photography, philosophy, and getting involved deeply in the art world, art galleries, connected with artists, and just learning how to be an artist. So that place gave me a wealth of knowledge and friendships. So I went there. By the time I left, I I realized I needed to have this equipment. So as a photographer, I needed a printer, I needed a scanner. And then that led me to create a business called Brooklyn Lightroom. And that is what I was doing for at least a year before we started Save Art Space. Right after college, I created that business to do printing and photography for other photographers I went to school with. Um, Save Art Space came to life um, when I was hanging out with my best friend, Travis, uh, who's the co-founder and, you know, my business partner of Save Art Space. And we were hanging out on the couch and we were smoking a ton of joints Mm -hmm. and it was, it was January and we were like, what are we going to do for Bush Open Studios? And I was probably on microdose of mushrooms at the time because I was microdosing mushrooms at the time. Nice. So I was just sitting there and allowing myself to download the cosmic information, <laughs> and bouncing ideas off each other and just hanging out like we always do, smoking sour diesel blunts. <laughs> so him and I were sitting and I was like, you know, what, Travis, I've been, we've been, we have been walking around, you know, and we've, we've been seeing all these bill, uh, all these billboards take over all the murals in Bushwick and Bushwick open studios 2015 was coming along 
And we were like, together, we were like, we should totally do something with public art. We should totally try to get these billboard companies to donate space for artists because they're putting their billboards over the murals that drew everyone there in the first place. Right. And that's a huge sign of gentrification because when the landlords start giving the advertisers the billboard space over the murals, over the art, over the soul of the community, that's when you start seeing gentrification. And that's when we started thinking, okay, we got to do something to thwart that. So we, we thought if we rent the billboards or get them donated, then we could put the art back over the ads that covered the art, which is why we were like, save art space. We're going to save the art space. And it started with billboards because it was taking over our town and we were sick of seeing shitty Corona ads. And yeah. ads. We were tired of it. We we're like, this is boring. This is, we're not, <laughs> this is boring. So the Sugar Open Studios came and it was coming up. And so him and I, we just started reaching out to the billboard owners saying, hey, this is our initiative. We, we started a nonprofit. We literally incorporated that day. We started our website that day. We were, we were smoking joints, non-mushrooms. We were like, we're going we're gonna to take this very seriously. We're going to call them up, start a website, start an Instagram, start a business. And that led to where we are now. But just as a backstory, we were using artists we looked up to on Instagram and Photoshopping their art on a billboard to have content to share with the world of what Save Our Space looks like Mm -hmm. and why you submit to it. And at the time, it was only it was free. Right. And after our first two shows, after I ran out of money because I was paying for it out of my pocket (laughs) as a seed investment into something beautiful and for everyone, At the time, I was, you know, I had a lot of artwork sold. I was saving all the money I've ever made in college from all of my photo and art adventures. I I was like holding on because I didn't know what I wanted to use it for. And I I wasn't the type of person who went out and drank and got wasted. You know, yeah, I bought an ounce here and there every month to smoke, but I was really involved in my art, artistic path and really involved in my art, creating, creating. So I had no time for that stuff. Um, I had saved $20,000 from those four years. And I said, Hey, let's, let's do this. I, I'm committed. I'm, I'm ready to spend this money on other people. I could have easily spent all that money for my own art for myself, but that wasn't the case at the time. My heart was like, we got to do something for everybody with everyone who lives and is native to Bushwick. So we worked with local Bushwick artists. We put up flyers. We started the Instagram. We got this shit going. And, and it was going, and then we had the curator and we curated the show. We chose local artists. That was our first exhibition. We got 12 billboards. Um, we were in hyper allergic that first show, a sprawling exhibition unto itself because it was in the epicenter of where everyone was walking on Flushing Avenue in Bushwick mm-hmm. off the Morgan L train. So that was like the hyper critical place we were at. And that's where all our billboards were. So I think that was a very important thing to, to note. Um, after that show, we were like, what's next, Travis? And we're like, let's do Miami Art Basel. So again, I used some more money that I shouldn't have, but I did because I wasn't confident enough to ask people to submit and pay $10 yet. Mm-hmm. So I bought more billboards in Miami. I bought like 12 more in Miami and we did the same thing in Miami and at that point, I was literally broke. And I was like, damn, Travis, I can't buy any more billboards. And he's like, dude, you should have never bought billboards in the first place. <laughs> you, you, you're you wasting your money. I'm like, I'm not wasting my money. This is an investment. But I understand why it seems like a waste of money because it's a lot of money. Sure. Um, to, for, for not knowing what you're going to do with it, right? What, what does like, a, if you had to guess like, on average, what does a billboard space cost in terms of like a big one that everyone can like look up and see? They definitely cost a thousand dollars all the way up to forty thousand dollars. Holy shit! <laughs> Since we're a nonprofit, they give us a great price, and we've been working with them for so long. We finally broke down like the price from twenty five hundred dollars to like a thousand dollars, and even that, it's like pulling teeth. But um, yeah, I mean, it's oh, it's always the case, right? So. We always wanted them to donate, you know, Lamar out front clear channel, but they just don't have the capacity to, mm. even though there's a statute that says that they have to donate mon- uh, space for PSAs, public service announcements. So there's a lot of, you know, moving parts in that. Um, billboards what? are very expensive. 
What does it, so? I'm just curious. What does uh, per, uh, like I guess legally, what does a public service announcement include? Can you just be like, can you make up your own, or does it have to come from you know somewhere yeah, like the CDC? Oh, it can't be political. Okay, not be political because that's then you get into their policies and political stuff. So yeah, that yeah. Doesn't, doesn't count as a PSA. You don't get the price, and we had to pay the price to put political art up. You know, we didn't get the good price. They gave, they made us pay a full price for our recent show in New York that we got in the New York Times for for the most important moments in 2020 for putting political art up during the election. So it was a lot of a lot of uh, restrictions, but you know, we broke through and we did it. It was the first time they actually censored us and made us put paid for by Save Art Space, and I and it killed me. It was like, damn, this makes the art totally like contaminated. I hate that. It looks like shit. They slapped the sticker up on there to save their own ass. And it was censorship. And we had to pay for that. And it looked like garbage. But you know what? My business partner says, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's just the way it's got to roll with the punches. And he's right. I'm more sensitive <laughs> and emotional about the art than he is because he's more of the business side. I'm more of the artistic community. I care. I have more care. Right. right. I really care about how it looks. And that's what really bothered me about it. Yeah. Um, so there's this, uh, this Banksy quote. I'm not exactly sure how it goes. And I, th I think it must be in exit through the gift shop from about 10 years ago, but he says something to the effect of like, you know, the billboard space or the ad space that is up in all these cities. That is actually like coming into your brain and like, you know, knocking on the door and rattling you a little bit trying to convince you that like you're not enough so that you will buy whatever product or service whoever is paying for the ad is trying to get you to buy and he says that uh graffiti or or public art is is kind of like a a punch back or a punching up at that kind of thing does that does that resonate kind of with, with your mission statement or, or your purpose behind Save Art Space? Let's just say we're in a friendly boxing match. We're not we're not in a street fight where right, it's, right. it's kill it's kill or be killed. This is more of like a friendly spar, right? Yeah, it's like and there's rules. Here's the thing, people need to be checked. And if they don't get checked, that's how fascism comes into play. That's how, you know, authoritarian views overpower you because you don't check them back and you let them get away with shit. Right. We as people cannot let them get away with shit. That being said, I'm grateful that they allow us to work with them. We get without them we can't. You know, they could have easily said fuck you guys, we don't want to work with you. You're just destroying what we do. It's not about that. In the end it's about the money, right? Sure. And the money we're spending is to support people. And my whole philosophy on Save Art Space is we don't we don't sell people I mean, we don't sell products. Right. We show people. This is so, this is like you know how they're rattling our brains with the subconscious brainwashing that they're doing with buy this car, buy this shoes, buy this beer. I'm more like if if we're showing the artist, that's art is getting into their brain, and I right. want to educate people with art because they don't have access to art. If you're not an artist or a gallerist or a collector or someone in the art world, you don't think about art. You right. don't care about art. Right. What, what we do enables you to see something new, something creative, something spiritually uplifting from someone who's poured their heart and soul into that work. And for them to be recognized and realized on a major media platform, it does something. It's not just there's there, there's something that wheat pasting and like spray painting a mural on a wall it has its own vibration to it but when you start putting things on a paid advertising space mm -hmm. that isn't to advertise a product there's something going on there that you really can't even comprehend because it's so subconscious right it um it affects you and you don't even know how or why it affects you but it does something right mm -hmm. and that's that's how i see save our space coming to play it's like that's our punch back that's our uppercut and you know what? They're going to get knocked out for 10 seconds, but they'll come right back up and they'll put their, you know, car ads and all that shit on until, you know, Save Art Space buys them out until we are a $10 billion company and we can buy Lamar out front and Clear Channel out and then use all those 
billboards across America to put artists on them. And that's really my long term goal is yeah. to just buy them out and put up art and forget about the ads. That's awesome. Um, how, so I was listening to you on Clubhouse again today, and the way that I'm kind of grokking what you do is it's it's sort of like a franchise franchisable thing for your nonprofit where you reach out to different people in cities like movers and shakers who are who are down with the mission um can you talk about that a little bit yeah i'd love to because we need that support and at the end of the day travis and i we're just two people yeah and we talk to them so much we, we get so many emails from everyone in the country like we actually need more employees, but we're not we're not at that scale fiscally yet. And hopefully this year we can have employees because right now it's just him and I. But we're seeking grant writers. We're seeking other people who want to lead the community in their town to be part of Save Art Space to franchise us and be and have like a little subsection of Save Art Spacers in every town in America. Mm-hmm. You know, we need that support because that's the only way this can this can come to life in that way. It could it could, it's, if it's just me and him. It really doesn't get further than just him and I. Um, where, it, where it does get further is when people start to recognize what we're doing and they fuck with what we're doing and they want to be part of that and yeah. they have a mission and they're passionate and they have a goal and they have a vision. Those are the people I seek because those are our allies and those are the people we need to connect with in order to change something in your town. Like, where are you based? Um, I live outside of uh, between Boulder and Denver in, in Colorado right now. Um, I'm fr- I'm, I was going to ask you if you have it looks like you have something in Denver going on for sure. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you if you know anyone in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes, actually we've done a bunch of works in Louisville, Kentucky. Cause that place is in d- d- dire need of art. Yeah. Yeah. They have Mitch McConnell there for over like 40 years, dude. They need, they need to be educated. They need to have more art. They need to have more accessibility. They need to think outside the box of what they've been told and shown their whole lives. Yeah. And I don't want to speak for those people. It's just what I perceive from when I think about or see the media portray Kentucky. It's, it has nothing to do with those people. Sure. It's everything to do with how the media shows them, right? They, mm-hmm. they, the media shows them as uneducated. I don't think they're uneducated at all. I think there's good people there. And I think... We just got to get their art on the billboard because they, they exist and the media is like putting a blanket over them, telling them you're stupid, you're uneducated. And that's not even true. The right. media is stupid and uneducated and they want us to be stupid and uneducated. Whereas Save Art Space want us to be intelligent and sophisticated because that's where growth is and that's right. where life comes from. So, you know, that's another boxing, you know, a left hook to the face to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the media kind of creates these narratives around certain groups of people you know it doesn't matter what group you're in but like you get this distorted feedback loop kind of thing going on when they're like no you're like this like you know kentuckians like you're all barefoot and like whatever you vote you all vote republican for however many years and uh yeah i think that like something like having public art on billboards like you were saying it's this it's this subconscious like little flip of a switch even if it's for a moment you see like possibility and you see something that actually makes you think instead of makes you think like oh i want that you know another point on what you're exactly saying that flip of the switch yeah is very you know, ingrained in the community, because if you're one of the artists in Kentucky who get the billboard and you have a family or friends who don't understand art, when they see you and what your achievements and accomplishments are having your art in the public space, that's another flip switcher Mm -hmm. because it's personal and personal is a connect is a connection that can't be flipped off. It can only be flipped on because it has something to do with your life. And when someone in your life who you love and care about or know, gets something like that, it it does something to you. And that's why we really try to reach everybody because everyone who's an artist, you know, has those people in their lives that can see their true value and wealth and, 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 and all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of uh, Marshall McLuhan? You Tell me of- about him. So he was, 
you know who Terrence McKenna is, right? Yes. So, I'm actually in contact with his brother, Dennis, nice. to have, have him in my uh, art projects. Oh, sweet. A personal art project where I photograph, you know, uh, psychonauts, mystics, artists, writers. Sweet. Take a look. It's uh, justinaversano.com slash mirrors. I actually, I did take a look at that and I had, um, I had one question based off that. Um, but so let me get back to Marshall McLuhan and then we'll, we'll talk about the photographs. So McKenna quotes him quite often in a lot of his talks and stuff. And basically his, uh, his kind of TLDR of his whole intellectual career is that the media or the medium is the message. It's not that like, it's not that like television is, uh, you know, you're not getting, the medium is not like what you're watching. It's actually television or podcasts. It's not, it's not what you're hearing. It's the fact that people are having this long form conversation that's unedited. And, um, I think that that, that really, really works with your project. Like it's, it's not necessarily what you're seeing. It's the fact that it is there and it is it is like kind of you know like you were saying like a left hook to these big companies who are just forcing things down your throat constantly we don't want to drink that juice anymore we want to have a healthy vegan meal instead of the fast food at mcdonald's hey there's some times where you need you're hungry and you're on the road you want to get a impossible <laughs> whopper yeah let's go get it i'm cool it's i'm not against anything it's just a matter of balance. And I'm just trying to redistribute the balance because sure. the scales have been way too much on advertising and co- consumerism and commerce. And that is detrimental to society. There's no money is imaginary, right? It has, this, it just goes up and up and up. But in reality is we're in a material world and we have a limited amount of resources until we go to space and mine stuff, but we're not there yet. Elon Musk hasn't got us there yet. All I'm trying to say is, we got to understand the reality and the balance of what we're doing with our behaviors in consumerism. We got to create a healthy consumerist behavior. And that's why I'm not against these corporations unless they are polluting the environment or destroying land or taking away land from people who don't have homes. And they really got to look at themselves in the mirror and say, listen, we need to have a stronger ethic for our consumers. You know, consumer is not a bad word. It's just a word that says these are people who buy stuff. Right. And I guess it's also the consumer's responsibility to know what you're buying and to know where that money's going. Mm-hmm. You know, you just buy a Coke, you drink it, you don't know wh- what water you're polluting with their factory, you don't know. So it's a matter of the, the true power is the people, right? And our money is the, is the, the flame to the, the torch of what light ignites this whole, you know, the train to go forward. So we got to take a step. We got to stop at the train station and say, listen, where are we going? What, what, this is a never ending train. Let's take Let's stop and appreciate the world around us. Look, there's a mountain here with snow on it. Right. We've been driving through the barren desert for years. So let's just chill right here. And you know, the pandemic really helped that because it allowed everyone to be home, be with your families, relax, just chill the fuck out. You know, because I was going hard in, in making things happen and making things work, and that's not healthy. It's not healthy for anybody. We gotta the, the balance is the most important thing, and I'm just trying to re 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 leverage the balance of that scale. I'm a Libra, so mm. I'm all about balance. Nice, and I'm just trying to create a balance of powers. Public art, advertising, they could be parallel. It's just a matter of don't let one outweigh the other because there's nothing good comes from that, and I'm sure that if we, there was too much public art that might disrupt businesses and people won't be able to feed their families. Right, so right. I'm trying to find that place, that marker where this supports this equally in balance and it's not exploiting or taking. It's actually, they need each other to be harmonized. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people lose sight of that, um, in terms of, uh, issues and cause and effect and, and having that balance. And I think it's important for businesses and artists to cooperate. Um, we're seeing that more and more, which is great. Um, but can you can you talk about how artists might get involved with Save Art Space? 
Yeah, there's so many ways that you can get involved just by following us or looking at what we're doing gets you involved. You know, seeing our billboards gets you involved. And if you want to be an artist who gets on the billboard, reach out to us, email me, follow us, say hi. It, it, it's all about building relationships, getting to know each other. And that's like what I stand by. Like it's all about building trust and relationships. And that's how you, that's how the art world runs in a way, the old art world. I don't know if there's a new one, but I believe public art is the future. And I know there's, there's a lot of digital NFT talk on the on, on Clubhouse. Yeah. It's kind of getting old because it's like going in circles because it's mm. so limited. Right. I feel like we need to bring that out of the digital box, bring that into the real world and show the truth of what these things can do together. Right. Yeah. I was talking to, you know, NFN Callion. No. No, uh, he's, he's on Clubhouse and... Um, He's released some NFTs. He's a he's actually like a physical painter, but he's released like editions of ten of some of his work and stuff like that. Are they, are they real prints or are they digital prints? They're digital prints, but he doesn't make like real prints. You know what I mean? So the thing about NFT is, I don't. To be honest, I don't see it operating in the digital world. I see it as a tool, as a blockchain ledger. Exactly. Yeah. To to authenticate and you know figure out where these things are at all times by within the real world i I see this thing as a digital tool blockchain for things in the real world like a warhol or 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 a piece that you make i see art behind you so it's like these are things that work with each other i don't really see the value in digital gifts for like two ethereum which is like three thousand dollars it's like can you actually you know have that in your house I, people might argue with me, you know, it's all about owning the content and whatnot. But the way I see it working in my perception is, and I try to do this with my art, is I want to create silk screens that I touched and I want to put those on the blockchain to make available to people um, who, um, sorry, someone's calling me, so I'm just like, it's losing okay. My- so, you, but you see what I'm saying? I want to make yeah. a physical item and catalog it on the blockchain to have for sale on the blockchain. And if it's sold on the blockchain or in real life, then I can authenticate it through NFT because that's how I see um, it operating, right? I see yeah. it work. Do you mind if you give me two seconds? Go for just, it. Uh, I think someone's here. Yep. Put me on pause. Someone, Someone's just coming to pick up an art piece right now. No worries. Yeah, I, I know what that's like. Um, okay. So yeah, back low. yeah, we were talking about NFTs, um, but one thing that the Callion mentioned, and he couldn't get into specifics, but like using the blockchain and NFTs, not just as like an, a new art market, which is great. Like you know, we, I don't know if we mentioned it yet, but when you sell an NFT on the blockchain, you obviously get money up front. Um, this is for the audience who doesn't know this, but, and then like if your piece of art is resold, which is what often happens in the art market, you actually get royalties. So that's, that's a really obviously like beneficial thing about it. That's what I love about it. That's fucking, and you could choose how much percent of the royalties you get. Yeah. That's super, it's super great for artists. And I'm all about that. Um, you know, we're living in a world where we need less and less, you know, middlemen, uh, as as technology develops but Callion was saying and again he couldn't get into specifics so i don't really know what's going to happen with it but using the blockchain and nfts as the actual medium as mm. the like transactional medium not even transactional but just like the medium for creating the art on it'd be like instead of using canvas and paint you're using the blockchain itself can you go into detail about that because i just don't understand that. i yeah, I don't know. To me, I'm like, I'm like so excited for whatever he he says he's working on a project about it. So, um, Callion, if you're listening, uh, holding your feet to the fire, bud. We don't, <laughs> we don't exactly know what's going on, but to me, that that seems exciting, or it seems like it could be a a new frontier for art, in a way. I agree with you, and I'm excited about it, especially the royalties part, because artists never see that. Only musicians do sometimes if they're intelligent enough to do that with their with their with their uh, ip right Mm -hmm. the way i see nft 
is definitely just being a platform and a tool to authenticate real works, like I was just saying. Yeah. But I definitely see, I'm not, I'm not like saying digital art's bullshit and those people don't know what they're doing. I'm just saying in the gallery world, in the, in the art making physical realm, that's just, I see how we could be selling art, like you said. Mm -hmm. So it is authenticated and we get the royalties and it's not, there is no middleman art dealer anymore. The art dealer is the platform. Right. But I, I don't understand when you say I'm making this art piece for the blockchain. I just don't understand because I'm making this art piece for me and I'm selling it on the blockchain because of those valuable assets that it accrues over time. And it's an easier transactional way to, to sell things and a place for it to live. That being said, I just don't understand what what that means when 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 you're what you're just talking about. Right. And I to be honest, I don't either, but I'm I'm you know excited to see what, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying any sense to that? Point? Yeah. Um like having just just using NFTs as the ledger instead of like creating a new art market, you can also use it as a ledger for physical art items. I see it working so much better for physical things because there's so many artists making canvases, making photographs, making sculptures. And, you know, yes, you could do AR and own that digital world in mm -hmm. that sense. But I just see it working as, you know, the, the auction houses, you know, Christie's, Swan Auction, all those big names. I can see them shifting over to the NFT because it keeps everything streamlined when the accountant's looking at all this shit and the collect and the and the consultants are like, who owns this Warhol? Where is it? Oh, I see. It went through them, them, and them, and they got paid. They got paid. Okay, I just see it working like that as like a way to keep track of everything. Right, right. Because they're definitely you know, in times of war or whatever, upheaval like a lot of art can be lost, you know. But if we had, since we have this new digital uh, technology that seems to be at least impervious to physical bullets, it, it's a nice way to like have hey, a record. Defaults, we're all fucked. Our Bitcoin's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> one solar flare. Yeah. I know. It's it's so interesting, right? Like when I think about the improbability of uh, of all this working all the time, I'm like, I got to pause and be grateful that it seems like it's being held together kind of by a thread, but it just keeps on moving forward. And I mean, look at what happened with the AT&T bombing that happened recently. I Their whole server shut down and like everyone who has AT&T fucking couldn't make phone calls. What happened? Do you, I don't know about the story. Definitely look it up. It was, it was in the news recently um, about uh, someone in a Winnebago just blowing up the block and it was blowing up the cell towers in, in the AT&T building and it shut down service for a long time, for like two days, three days. Was it like a hack? Or? No, it was a bomb. It was a physical explosion. Oh, shit. And, 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 but the weird thing is, the person who was in there, who I think committed suicide in that bombing, was telling everyone, get away, get out of here, I'm about to bomb this shit. And like, in the, in the, in the, just like warning people, this isn't to kill anybody. This is actually just to destroy the... The towers. Uh, yeah. Man. It's weird. But that just goes to show, getting back to our why we're talking about that, is electronics, you know, how well are, can they be trusted versus the physical thing, like a dollar in real money and then the Bitcoin and digital. You know, you could burn a dollar. You could also burn out a hard drive. Yeah. So it's like, I guess it's all the same. Yeah. Do you, do you, are you invested in crypto at all? Yeah. Yeah. Same. I've been <laughs> early 2000, like I would say I got in before 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Then I always bought and sold it, bought and sold it. But this time I'm just, you just got to keep it. Yeah. Yeah. I've been holding since like middle of 2017. Um, not very much because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I guess I'll throw just like, like couple hundred in there every now and then at a hundred you know if you if you spent a hundred dollars in 2012 when it was 15 dollars of bitcoin yeah you would, you would have had like eight bitcoin that shit would have been worth a million dollars i need to find this so i think that i bought some around that time but the hard drive the little external hard drive that i had my wallet on like won't 
boot up anymore. Um, so anyway, You're one of those millionaires who can't access their wallets. Maybe I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. It's like eh, I wouldn't. It definitely wouldn't be in the millions, but um, yeah. Um, so let's get back to um, uh, like the art world here. Um, I do you, you know you're from New York. You know Fran Leibowitz. Uh, yes. So I just she has like a Netflix special out right now and uh, or a special. She's a she's, director, a filmmaker. She's a she's a writer. I hadn't heard of her until my friends were like, "Oh, you got to check this out." And she was talking the name, but can you can you describe them a bit more? She's like um, she's like. She moved to New York in the 70s. She's an older Jewish um, lesbian lady. And she's kind of just like this <laughs> grumbling, complaining critic. But she does it in such a humor, like f- humor filled way that she's really like, you really love her. I guess some people uh, hate her. You either love her or hate her. But um, she was talking about how at Christie's Auctions House, they'll bring out a Picasso, right? And no one claps when it's brought out, but then the auction starts going off and then it sells for 160 million and everyone's like, you know, like, hooray, like they clap for the money and not the art. Um, and so I, I am assuming that like Save Art Space is you're trying to get people to think about art outside of the context of a market necessarily right it's mostly just to support the artists yeah and, and give them the spirit and esteem they deserve like i've seen i the first show we did we work with a disabled artist who has autism in a school and we partnered with the school ebc high school mm-hmm. his name is isaiah and you know he was always making art right and his and i and his parents didn't believe that this could be a career but the second they saw his art on a billboard, I was there. I saw the family break down and cried. I cried. Because yeah. I saw the mom realize this kid's potential. And it wasn't just a game. It wasn't just arts and craft. This is this kid's God-given talent. And this is what he needs to be doing on earth. And that's what I recognize in humans. And that's what I want to keep pushing out in the world. That's what Travis and I love more than anything. Is like we, we love the reaction and response, the artists and their families and everyone who sees it and gets it. We that's what we keep doing this for. It's like that that beauty coming out of them from seeing something they've created, living somewhere that they never thought would, is the most beautiful thing. It makes me so happy, and my heart is just glowing when I when I feel when I, when I see that and. And that's what really drives Save Our Space is that building the heart consciousness instead of thought consciousness because we do got to act from our hearts and we got to stop overthinking everything. We just got to create and do what we feel is right and do what our heart tells us to do. Yeah. Why do, why do you think that there is that? I think it's kind of a myth now. It's been more or less proven a myth, but why do you think there's the myth that keeps going that, that says like, oh, it's you'll never you can't make it as an artist you can't actually make a career as being an artist or or someone in the creative field i know why <laughs> it, it's jealousy it's jealousy that they've learned to push away their desires of being who they truly are and settling for something that they aren't because it's comfortable it's easier it's what they were taught it's what they were told and once you break free from that, from other people's opinions and ideas of who you are, and you truly be the person you are, you stop being jealous and you stop telling other people, like they, like other people told you to stop being an artist. Because I can't be an artist, you can't be an artist. I'm like, listen, motherfucker, <laughs> I don't care if you suck at making art because you didn't try hard enough, or you didn't practice like you should have been, or whatever that art means. It's like, it goes for everything. It could be a chef, it could be a musician, it could be a mechanic. Someone who loves what I see art is is someone who loves what they're doing and creating in the world, and that's what art means to me. Is like if you love what you're doing and you're creating it from that love space, that's art. It's not just a picture. It's not just a painting. It's something that your heart creates, and that's heart is an art. So yeah. you know, earth, earth, art is an earth. So like heart and earth, we act from our heart to help heal the earth, and this is like everything I stand by. So it's like. Don't listen to other people. 
even even critics because critics are meant to beat you down so you make right. better things so you got to listen to yourself you listen to your heart and just be yourself in the world and don't be afraid you know to take risks and to, you know how many times i was afraid because i didn't know what was going to happen or i didn't have money to do this and that but i quit my job to be an artist and i trusted myself because that's only the only thing you can count on is you and what you do right now I'm here and I'm happy and I have a successful business and it's growing every day and I'm meeting cool people like you and this is all coming from that love and if I didn't do this and if I quit when I when all the kids from school told me like you're crazy this is never going to work why are you doing this like you're dumb and I was like okay well I'm going to do this you don't have to do it with me and when five years from now when you see me in the New York Times mm. I hope you recognize how dumb you were sounding when you said that to me yeah so do you think everyone is an artist? Um, in their own way, yeah. They, if they could, like, if they, if I'm not like a paint, like, not like technically. Sure. If you look at a child, they have that innocence and authenticity, and that's what art comes from, right? Art, right. Art, is thing, art is a feeling. It's not a thing you create. You know, art can be said, oh, this is art. If you look at this painting I have here. That's what yeah. a physical manifestation of art is. But the spiritual, ma the spiritual manifestation of what art is lives inside of you. And the thing you create is the art piece that came from that source of innocence, authenticity, your heart, your heart, that truth, right? The art is the truth from who you are and your perception. So I believe everyone is an artist if they could tap into that space in them and, you know, decalcify all the bullshit that they put put on top of that spot and you got to chisel away at it by doing what you love and right. if you do what you love what makes you feel good to me surfing is art Absolutely. i love i love skateboarding i love biking that's art because it makes me feel and when you feel something that's what art is i'm right there with you um i think that artists are, are basically just people who have sort of preserved and nurtured their inner child into adulthood um not that they're like childish and petulant or anything like that, but like someone who, who like understands that that's where, you know, that's probably where the height of each of us killing it was, is when we were kids and just like being free and expressing ourselves freely. And I think that like also technically language itself is an art form. So if you're out here talking if you're out here writing a Facebook post, you are creating something, you know, like it's, it's a technical thing too. We actually have to use obviously language to communicate right now. And, and I'm, tr I'm trying to chisel away at like a mission statement for this podcast. I mean, we're like 60 episodes in now, but, um, I think that really I want to convince everyone that, if maybe you're not an artist, but it's a very great lens to view your life through because you are creating a life, you are making choices. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of add on to that there at the end. I think that's beautiful. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm there, one of your 60th people on here, you know? Yeah. And not many people ask me to be on their podcast. I actually just started my own podcast called the Save Art Space Show nice. with, with Travis. And what our goal is in that is to speak to all the 400 artists we've worked with since 2015 and just talk to them, share their story, share their thoughts, why public art's important, why art's important, who they are, get to know them better. Really, it's just for us to connect with more people and get to know them better and have that conversation and build the relationship. I don't care if a million people see this or if this becomes as successful as the Joe Rogan show. Right. What I care about is the person I'm speaking to and connecting with them and understanding their way of thinking and being because we did something for them in the public art realm. So I want to understand them better and, and build that relationship more and not just have it like a one night fling. Hey, see you later. Thanks for the art. No, I want to re re revisit it and reconnect and continue the relationship because who knows if one day we'll have an art agency or an art museum and we want to work with everybody. So I want to continue building relationships and that's what's important to me is building that trust and the relationships yeah i kind of see you 
as this sort of weaver of 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 artists and and communities and would you say that's a an accurate take of the medium you're working in i mean i'm not a textile designer but <laughs> in the spiritual sense i'm i'm just trying to show the potential of what public art can do and how artists fit in that realm because we all just want to feel belonged in a community and artists are the ones who don't ever feel they, like they belong. They're always the black sheep. So I'm creating a safe space, safe art space for those people to commune, to gather, to connect. And it's just be through art and public art. And, you know, we come together in the public space and even art, not even the artists, the people who pass by and see it. I just want to create a way for more exposure for the artists and to allow accessibility to people who don't even care about art. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like the, the educational system obviously does not favor any sort of arts education. So you're you kind of take this conversation outside. I want to bring, yeah, for sure. Outside. So, yeah, I just, I also think that you guys are sort of giving a, uh, this quick art education to people, um, as they pass by on the street and it, it creates, you know, there's the whole idea of the viewer as also contributing to the project in this in this kind of roundabout way. Yeah, I mean, they are part of it because they're the audience. They're the people who are, they're the public part to the art. Yeah, and that, and that's the important thing um, about this whole project is it's not just for the artists; it's for the people who are um, seeing it. That's what the public word means. And that's what I'm really trying to convey and get them educated and get them on the, on the track with us. Like, Hey, look, art, 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 art. Maybe I should get art. Cause yeah. you know, the art, it's better to buy from a local artist than it is to just go to Coles and buy a shitty <laughs> made mass produced thing. Like, don't you want something unique? Don't you want something right. beautiful that your friend who's an artist makes? Why are you going to Coles? and buying some bullshit when your best friend is an artist and they make silk screens or mini paintings that will go great in your living room. Right. Right. So it's just like, it's a matter of also realizing who, who's around you and the, um, I'm just going to sit down <laughs> and, um, that, that like recognizing, like if your friend owned a mechanic shop, you'd go to them cause you love them and you care about them and you want to give them money. You want to support their business. Same thing goes for artists. Like, we need your support. This isn't just a game that we're having fun. This is our career. Like, people need to recognize the importance of the career that we chose, that we sacrifice our life. We could have been an accountant. We could have been a lawyer. But that doesn't serve us or the world at large. So I, one of the subjects from my Twin Flames project, uh, Michael North just came by to pick up his art. So like I was just saying, art friendship people i just gave him a piece because he's in the project so now he has a piece from me of what we created together in his home and i'm expanding into other people's homes through creation through creativity and that's beautiful and when they see that picture the portrait we made together he'll remember that moment he'll remember the project he'll remember wow that was actually a really cool thing to be part of 10 years 20 years later and that's why art's important it's a one-time thing you purchase you don't like that's one meal two meals when you're going out to eat with your friends and family, it's like over $250, $250 right? For that one meal. Yeah. You have this one piece that will last you a lifetime. Yeah. People need to start realizing the potential of owning art and, you know, as an investment and as an asset and also just to support your friend who makes these things. Um, Beautiful. To, for your family, for the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah. 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 So I want to, I want to pivot. Um, and talk about Clubhouse a little bit. Um, I'm pretty stoked on it. And for, for people who aren't familiar, Clubhouse is, uh, if you've been listening to the podcast a few episodes ago, I actually was talking with my friend Anthony Thogmartin, and I was like, I had what I thought was a novel idea at the time where I was like, you know what would be cool? If we had like a social media platform where all you could do is post video and audio content and like there would be no text no text space at all and then i find out about clubhouse which is it's kind of like a a chat room but it's all audio 
Um, so like moving shit around here. Um, I definitely want to talk on that because Clubhouse really opened my eyes. Yeah. And my, my heart to sharing myself in new ways. Mm -hmm. I felt very limited to Instagram and Twitter. I felt like I didn't know the consistency on how much I needed to post because I only create a certain amount of images because I want to uh, control my output and have like, these are the certain images I released during my lifetime. That's why they're going to be valuable. That's why what I'm creating is very special because it's limited. I'm not overdoing. I'm not overproducing. I'm creating certain things right for my certain projects the birthday project twin flames mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors i'm creating very focused works i'm not shooting random shit and making that work um that being said clubhouse is a place to engage and communicate with people who you want to connect with and that's what instagram was made for but i feel like it became a, a, a popularity contest it became a show-off platform and you lost the whole idea of connecting the people and i see social media as a tool to meet people and then meet them in the real world yeah and create more things i think we got stuck with instagram and scrolling and liking and now the ads are on there and now it's just like a cesspool yeah and i think where clubhouse picks up is the ability to speak to people in an equilateral level where no one's the coolest in the room. Everyone has a voice. Everyone's, depends what room you're in, but the rooms I like to spend time in is sharing, caring, and giving that respect to everyone in the room, everyone in the audience, everyone, because no one's better. No one's more intelligent. No one's more creative. No one's more successful. We're all here together, and I'm trying to level the playing field by communicating, and communicating is key, and we all deserve that chance to speak. Like, if I was ever a celebrity, I would be. I would still make have run these rooms and ask these questions and tell people to reach out because that doesn't that doesn't do anything for me. What right. does something for me is connecting to the one person who has two followers, but they're doing something really cool, and that's who I'm looking for when I do these things. It's like that's that's who we're trying to support. Mm -hmm. Why are we going to support people who already have all the support? Right, 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 and it it. it literally allows people to use their voice which i think is super important because with text you don't have to listen and listening i think is such a key part of life and you can get a person's tone of voice you can get um just their off the cuff thought process without you know maybe reacting like you would to some text because if you see text and as you're reading it, it makes you angry or confused or scared, you start to read that text as angry, confused, and scared. So it's going to, you know, you like, boil that up in tone, you. Your tone, your interpretation of the tone can skew things and exactly. create a miscommunication when you're trying to communicate something. Yeah. That's why I've recently, since Clubhouse, I stopped texting and I've only been doing voice messages. Nice. And I'm like, that's the easiest way to communicate. Like, I don't want to text what I'm fucking thinking. I want to say what I'm saying, and you get it, and then you can tell me what you said. And it's like a conversation. It's not like I got to edit what I'm saying. I, does this sound good? You're showing everyone in the room. Does this sound good? Okay, sending, send, it, send. So this is like enough of that. We need, yeah. to, we need to be authentic. Just speak your truth. You know, and some people not like. Some people might not like what you say, and some people might resonate like you did, and which is why we're having this conversation. Right, right. And even if, but the thing is, I think is like, even if you don't like what someone's saying, you don't have to interpret it in a, a, the wrong way. You know what I mean? Like someone has their opinion, they can say it. And you can be like, well, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to completely write this person off because I can tell that they're being genuine or being curious or they just like, maybe it's a teaching moment that you can jump in and be like, well, here's a counterpoint to what you said. Um, and those are the best moments because that's where we all learn. Exactly. Instead exactly. of speaking to the choir, those people are cha challenging our ideas and values. And, you know, and maybe we both can learn something from this conversation because the toughest conversations aren't peaches and cream. It's like you got to dive deep into, into this and really, and really talk about these difficult things because that's where growth happens. Absolutely.
so yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to touch on that. Um, I think it's very exciting. Um, I hope that it doesn't get overrun by ads. I hope it stays in this like kind of pure state. Uh, Who knows if they'll sell out to, to Facebook, but I hope they don't. I, I really hope not. I love this platform and I don't want to scroll and scroll forever. I just right. want to talk to the people I'm talking to. Right. Right. So let's see how long that takes. Yeah. Uh, do you see any potential, like, you know, there's a trick to seeing around corners with like problems that might arise. Do you see any problems that might arise with Clubhouse? What I see happening is them adding the image feed to make it more streamlined and like having posts. But I really think it's perfect as it is. I don't think it needs anything new to make right. it better or more engaging. I think the people engaging with each other is is the content. Right. So you don't need to fill it up with shit. You just need to let it be and let it grow and let it. I mean, how are they going to the, the question with those tech companies in every situation is how do we monetize this business? Have you seen the movie? Um, what is that? The social dilemma? Yes. The key speaker in that was the guy who made the like button in the ads was like, how do we monetize on this app? Yeah. And those people, those are the people that actually make the gravest mistakes if they don't really think about the effects right. on what their monetization looks like and how that affects everyone's daily use. So those people must be really responsible and accountable for everything they do because that's the type of shit that will get us into trouble mm-hmm. and to and to, you know, exactly what happened with Facebook. You know, it makes us addicted. So right. if you see that it makes people addicted, maybe you shouldn't do it. Maybe you're like a fucking meth dealer a social media meth dealer and you don't really want to make your clients addicted and, you know, make their family get lost and whatnot and all those negative things. So, you know, just because you would do something doesn't mean you should. Right. Right. That's yeah. I think that that could be the mantra for uh, Silicon Valley moving forward with, with tech platforms. Also, I wanted to say that like the thing that's like quote unquote addicting about clubhouse is, is conversation, which I think humans are just naturally ad- addicted to anyway. It's like literally a part of our biology to be social animals. And and so just keep it at that, you know? Like we don't need all this flashy like button, popularity contest, difference, all that stuff. The difference between what you what that is is one is is self-isolating. Yeah. And it's because you're filling your, your holes in your heart with those – products and with the posts and your fake happiness on Instagram and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But the, the positive addiction, you know, I wouldn't even call it an addiction. I would right. call it a reason to stay on this longer because I'm having genuine conversations with people I can network with and grow with and share my life, my stuff with. Right. Yeah. One is isolating. The other one is really building community. And I think it's healthier to build with others than it is to spend more time by yourself feeling like you want to connect with others. And that's the best the major difference is you want to connect, but this platform isn't allowing you because it feels too isolated. This one is unisolating. It's completely immersed, immersive with everyone. And I think that's good. The only thing that could be a problem is I spent my whole morning on Clubhouse thinking, you know, we were going to do this podcast. I was like, oh, I have an hour. I'll, I'll be on Clubhouse. That shit, you were even on it. Yeah, yeah. I hopped on real quick. It was two, hour, it was two hours. And I was like, okay, I gotta call. I gotta, I gotta end this room. Like, you know, I just gotta end this room because I gotta make people appreciate what we're doing here, and I, I don't want to overextend it. Sure. And I had to, I had to be that, you know, that process in your frontal cortex that's like the no button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, all right, Justin, this is the no button. You gotta like end it now. Leave everyone to think about what we're talking about. Otherwise, the conversation never ends, and you can't ever digest what what's been said. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, leaders of the room need to know when to stop and to and to to know their accountability and responsibility and i was like okay i could keep this going i could let other people moderate but i was like you know what that doesn't feel right i'm just gonna end it so it gets people excited for the next one and maybe it should only be an hour long yeah so you you don't waste your entire morning your girlfriend's mad at you because (laughs) you're not paying attention to her and whatnot yeah yeah yeah. that's that's important to realize and i don't want to be that person i want to have I want to spend enough time to connect with people, but also live my life outside yeah. of that. It's addicting because you want to connect with so many people, but it's also like you got to have a restraint of your everyday life. And like, okay, that was yeah. enough. 
I had enough. Yeah. My father was growing like crazy, but I don't want to keep that. I don't want to. That's not the only thing that I'm doing this for. So I'm going to end it here. I'm going to make breakfast. Call it a day. Yeah, it's just it's the same thing as like, you know, water is good for you, but like drinking two gallons at once might kill you. You know, you have to be able to process and digest and like hop off for a little bit, then hop back on. And that's how you learn. You have to take that break, sort of that like, you know, you're at the top of the peak of the of the wave mm-hmm. and then you like come back down and take a little rest. Um, So... Want to pivot one more time? Just a small pivot here. It feels like every time I'm on Clubhouse, the it, I I pretty much only have gone into rooms about art so far, or with other artists in there. But every time I'm on there, people are talking about some new exciting um, AI or or technological advance with merging with art. Um, I've noticed that too. Yeah. I'm always trying to bring it back to like, hey guys, let's talk about real life stuff. Everyone wants to talk about NFT. Everyone wants to talk about virtual experiential art. But I'm just like, yo, 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 slow down, slow down. Remember what we what we came from. Remember what we built these things off of. Like, let's not pay, let's let's pay respect to the elders and and reality. We yeah. don't want to spend too much time in the digital world yeah. because we are human beings in the real world and. We don't want to become surrogates for AI. We want to be ourselves. So mm-hmm. that's where I like to draw a line when I'm having those conversations and people were trying to like hijack the room to talk about NFT and other shit. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's bring this back to public art, the real world. And if you want to talk about NFT and all that stuff, connect it with what I'm talking about. Otherwise, I, it doesn't have anything to do with what this conversation is about. Right. Yeah, that's, that's another good point to like, have rooms with like an explicit purpose or an explicit topic that you kind of want to revolve the conversation around. I think that also is, is part of the responsibility of like the moderator, the person who creates that room. Um, well, I was going to ask you, uh, (laughs) where, where do you see technology taking art? And also where do you see tech or art taking technology? in I don't know, say the next decade. So me, I like to be balanced, right? Yeah. I don't like to fully immerse myself in the digital world and only think about digital things. I only care about digital transactions and Bitcoin and NFT and AI. You know, there's a use for that. And we need to understand, because it's coming at us so fast, what that use looks like and how we could use it responsibly. Otherwise, we're just throwing ourselves into the matrix. Mm. We're going to plug ourselves in and we're going to lose ourselves. And I'm trying to be the force that's like, yo, walk, tread lightly because there's something here. We really need to sit and understand before we just jump into it. Yeah. So that's why I like, you know, balancing. I love all that. I love new things. I love learning. I love understanding. I love technology, but I also understand the value of looking at what we're trying, what's coming at us. And, um, what's that word? It's, like filtering these things so we can move. Uh, how do we use those things as tools to help us and not make us slaves to its uh, means? Right. How do we make it serve us rather than us serving it? Yeah. So that's really important to me. And like before we have this like neural link thing that Elon Musk created, like how do we responsibly source and use those things without getting hijacked and hacked with our, within our brains? And yeah hitting singularity through his SpaceX satellites and Tesla batteries and Neuralink modules in our brain that, you know, we can instantly be turned on and like become robotic AI brainless humans. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just like something you always got to think about is like, what is this technology doing? Who is it serving? Yeah. Is it for me? Is it for, is it for someone else? Mm. Is it a monetization game? What's going on here? That's why being in reality and being in nature is the best place to meditate on those things. And at the end of the day, it's about balance. How do we balance real reality and the digital world? Mm-hmm. And that's, right. that's, you always got to have those two things equal equalize or else we're fucked. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's definitely uh, good to be cautious until, and I don't even know if we can fully understand the implications and, and again, seeing around corners 
with with some of the technology that we're messing with. But, you know, some people think that, um, and this is in quotes, I can't remember who said it, but that we're just the sex organs for AI. That, like, we're, like, the chimpanzees and the AI is, like, the the next iteration of human or something like that. And I really, I hope that that's not the case. Um, but I mean, I, I do see something kind of cool in, in, in terms of being able to know someone's inner world and like maybe, maybe being able to experience what it would be like to be another person person because i think that would really shoot the empathy like way through the roof yeah um, you can do that by taking psychedelics yeah that's true that's true you don't need to put on an <laughs> oculus headset to be someone else you can literally astral project and be someone else. i've been in a shamanic ceremony or mm-hmm. someone i knew who was in south africa who was a shaman was coming while we were on this psychedelic medicine was coming through another person in the in the circle speaking from how the like the voice and like how i know that person speaking like totally coming through that person it's 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 how we perceive and you know it's all this spiritual collective unconsciousness and that collective unconsciousness is real and that's actually what ai and singularity is trying to mimic because we made computers yeah. based out of who our human computer mm-hmm. right so my, my the point I'm making here is we can do that without we can do that naturally and we've always been able to do that um, for thousands of years through medicines through plants that's why the fungi are coming at us like yo take me don't forget who you are don't forget what Earth is you know the cacti the ayahuasca all that stuff all the the, the number one word it really wants us to see here is remember mm-hmm. remember who we are remember what we come from just remember what being human is. It's nice. always it's always the lesson, and with when you take those things. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, um, yeah, man. Okay, I wish I had some psychedelic questions just like lined up for you. Um, where, so, how has that informed your decision making uh, as you move through the world, the the like art world of of galleries and and having to you know, talk to big agencies like Clear Channel and Lamar. Like, do you do you try and feel like empathy even with people you're sparring with? That's my business partner's job. <laughs> gotcha. I'm, I'm completely committed and devoted to the artist side and the creativity and like the human side. He's, he's working with the machine. Gotcha. Right? He's the one uh, collaborating with the machine. So he handles all that. So I'm the one really with the open heart here. Cause if I was the one working with them, my heart would be slashed open with their shit and I don't want that shit. So he protects me. My business partner protects me and I'm the one nurturing the artists. Doing like the school. groundwork. Yeah. He's the warrior. Like shh, shh, I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm the, I'm like the healer trying to like, he's protecting me while I'm healing these people, <laughs> helping, helping these people, feeding these people nurture while he's like fighting off bad guys. And, <laughs> matching matching their shit yeah, yeah so that's why the partnership between you know someone like me and someone like travis who's really you know grounded and i'm more ethereal and spiritual and yeah, yeah airy you need you need those two forces to balance and also to work with each other i agree yeah yeah again it's all about balance right and and think about what you said about how the psychedelic medicine comes into play there is an intelligence that it has and it's ancient and it gives you the intelligence of the earth when you consume these things, right? Right. So your body also has an intelligence. DNA, immunity, those are intelligent, you know, systems that our body naturally has. And understanding the intelligence of our body and the and the ways it works guides us through life. You know, that's what people might call what God is, is divinity through spirit like the spirit is truly just intelligent working through us right in the world right and I, the reason why i say intelligence is i just read a book called quantum healing by deepak chopra mm-hmm. and in that it, says, it talks all about how your mind can heal the body if you put intention 
into it. So I fell on my skateboard and I felt like I did this and busted my elbow. It looked like it was broken. And it yeah. was bruised and it felt twisted. But I was like, no, I'm healing this. I'm, I'm manifesting this. I'm not going to accept that it's broken. I'm going to touch this and heal this. Breathe into it. And then that's been a month ago. This shit was all purple. Now it's like back to normal. Nice. It's like your intentions really carry weight. And if you give in, you know how many people were telling me, your arm's broken. You need to go to a doc- doctor. I'm like, no, my body is literally telling me from the inside. I was 1% away from shattering that bone, but it's a bruised, it's a sprained elbow. Yeah. And you just knew. Yeah. And I wasn't allowing other people's opinions or thoughts infiltrate my being. Otherwise, if I did, it would have been broken. Hmm. With the power of your mind that allows you to believe how you feel because that's what's the truth. And I'm healed. I'm completely back to normal. And that was only a month ago. Have you heard of the book? Uh, it's called Healing Back Pain. It's this um, Harvard uh, doctor of medicine who did studies, I think, ranging back to the like either 70s or 80s. And a lot of people would come to him being like, my back hurts. I haven't been injured. I don't know why it hurts. But basically, the the conclusion that he came to through all of these scientific studies is that like a lot of back pain... Uh, especially back pain for some reason is just people's manifested uh, suppressed anxiety and anger. And once you, a lot of times all it would take is for him to point that out and they'd be like, Oh, the knots in my back are gone. I need to be able to express these things when they come up so that it doesn't just, you know, tense up my back so it doesn't just hide out you know near my spine kind of like this dormant thing that keeps building up and building up and so there's some like definite scientific literature to that too so i agree and i've studied the same exact things and it's literally the dis-ease in your body that's why it's called disease yeah yeah. and you never got into like a physical Thing, but your back starts to hurt. That's 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 something you're carrying spiritually that you haven't released. And I'll and I'll give you an example. Um, so I've been carrying grief, sorrow, all this, all these painful things in my lungs. And mm-hmm. recently, I've just been like, I've been excavating those grief places because I, I lost my mom seven years ago, and I, I healed with my sister and spoke about that. And when I did, like all this mucus and gross shit came from the bottom of my lungs out and it felt like a fucking exorcism of all this gross shit coming out of my lungs because I wasn't allowing myself to breathe. I felt suffocated in grief and sorrow and all this negative shit. So when my sister came, she basically was like my shaman and healing me. And like, she was there for me. She showed up for me and held the ground spiritually for me. And it allowed me to connect to those deep wounds and excavate and heal and pull it out and let it go because there's no room for it. Otherwise it turns into cancer. It turns into um, emphysema. It turns into, um, what's that disease where you don't worry, the mucus doesn't stop. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's just the more you build, build, build on it, the more you set yourself up for disaster. So you gotta, you gotta get that, get it before it's too late and you gotta excavate those deep wounds from childhood from you trauma, from all those things. And the back pain comes from that. The back pain is like the stress of, you know, your mom and dad getting divorced or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You got to accept these things and the acceptance sets you free. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you on that. That's cool. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't, don't realize even the, the healthy effects of just talking about that shit. Cause I think a lot of that stuff is just bottled up words or expressions not being able to come to the surface and and seeing the light of day and being able to be aired out and and um and to circle back i think that that's why like clubhouse is is a pretty important app at the moment um yeah so i have one last question for you um oh wait wait i did want to get to uh the photography and Twin Flames. Can you talk you about have, Twin you Flames? You have me, man. You have me. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about Twin Flames for a bit? Because that's like, that's a book that you released, right? 
Yeah, I just released a book called Twin Flames. It's my first photo book. Um, the project is me traveling the world photographing 100 twins. And it's actually in the honor of my twin who passed away. And I'll give you, the, and I'll give you a little backstory on that. Okay. It, start, it started with the birthday project. The mm -hmm. birthday project I did while I was in college, 2012 to 2013. And every day of the year, I spent walking around New York City, San Francisco, you know, places that I was at every single day with a sign that says, is it your birthday today? And I found someone at every single day whose birthday it was. And I took a Polaroid of them. And <laughs> I had awesome. the whole year in the calendar. And if you go to my website and you go to every day as a gift, I did that project because my mom was – dying of cancer and she had in the living room that something that said every day is a gift and that would inspire me and like give give me meaning to life so that year i was like i'm gonna show my mom i'm gonna do a really massive project uh, this is for her this is like showing her what every day is a gift looks like through humans and it allowed me to that project putting myself out there every day before social media really took off and just being myself and showing the world me like I, People thought I was a homeless kid asking for money, but and someone even handed me a dollar. I was like, "Yo, no, no, no. did you look at my sign? It says it's your birthday today." And I literally found someone every single day. I didn't do it every day because I knew people whose birthday was that day. But the days I didn't, you yeah. you'll see me in the streets with that sign. Yeah. Point being, that year my mom passed away after I took her picture. So that was the last photo I took. January sixteenth, twenty thirteen, was the last time I photographed her. And she passed later that year. And actually a year later, she passed away in 2014, um, on, like two days after her birthday. So that project was really honoring her and showing her who I was as a human and connecting with people and breaking out of my shell, letting go of anxiety. That project really helped me become someone who doesn't care what people think about me because it allows me to connect with people who do. Right. That's just the precursor, right? What led to that project was my mom had ovarian cancer. And that twin flames, she had a miscarriage during our pregnancy with me. And I lost my fraternal twin sister, who I later is known as Alessia. In the spirit world, she came to me in a shamanic ceremony. Some psychics were with me. They were communicating through her. It was a whole shamanic thing. And I carry, I carry a lot of grief in my back from that. And during that experience, I, I was like roaring and crying and, and releasing it in a fucking black bat shadow thing came out of my mouth and flew away. So Twin Flames comes from honoring my mom, my twin sister who never came to life. But in a way, I'm connected to the spirit world through my twin. And I'm in the real world. So it's like this, I have these spiritual guardians with me at all times because of those connections. Um, twin Flame is, is just me trying to connect with other twins, understanding that relationship, honoring other twins, because I see twins as mythic, sacred guardians. And they're, they're a sign of luck. If you, depending on what culture you're studying, you'll get different, um, different interpretations. So that project I finished 2017 to 2018, I had a major exhibition in New York. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm now in LA. The books are finally seeing the light of day. I have like a hundred left out of 500. Nice. So, and I just, that's what that twin came here earlier to, to give him the print. So I only made, uh, two original prints. One in the, they're both dark room. So if you see my website, you saw the big wall of all the art. Mm -hmm. Um, those are one of one darkroom C prints because the way I shoot photography, I like to create it as one unique object because phot photography is very reproducible. Sure. So I try to, try to show people that photography is actually the sacred object and there's only one of it. So it should be taken seriously. The only other one in existence outside this one of one is the APs that I gave to the twins because the twins deserve the books and the prints as right. being part process so the only other people in the world that own it are the twins and there's the only the one of one meant for a collector a museum whoever that's just how i do my art i create one thing nice. unless it's a book screen and i could do like additions but that's a different story so twin flames is a, a, i shot with a four by five and a tlr twin lens reflex 
and you know, I went to the UK, I went to the West Coast, I went to Peru, and I did all these things, and I followed the path. And the way I found all these twins was, I every twin I met, they they introduced me to another twin and another twin, until I met a bunch of twins through social media after them see, seeing what I'm doing. And that's exactly what happened with the birthday project. As time went on with the birthday project, it was easier for me to find birthdays because everyone knew what I was doing. Yeah. And this was before Instagram. <laughs> and Twin Flames is part of Instagram. So Instagram is a way where my artwork can live so people could see and connect with me and be part of the project. Mm-hmm. But now that I'm getting into Clubhouse, it's making it way easier for me to connect with more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the Twin Flames... It's all a healing journey and all of my artwork is really based on death and transmuting that pain into something beautiful and honorable through art. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I connect with that a lot. I, I put, I put a lot of skulls in my artwork. Um, and some people find it like, you know, macabre or whatever, but I, it's more like a, it's more like paying respect. Is that I, one of yours right there? Um, the black yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Can you uh, grab it? I want to see it. Yeah, sure. Quick. Yeah, hang on one sec. Let's see what you got going on. So this is uh, this is a work in progress. Um, I've been doing some a lot of black and white stuff, just kind of focusing on like values and not color so much. And in this one, I'm trying to kind of integrate like patterns and the natural world. Uh, Do you know so, Emma Stern? Emma Stern. Yeah, look up Emma Stern. Okay. She's one of my really close friends, and she she makes artwork in that form, and I think you'd really appreciate her work. Nice, nice. Okay, let me write I'll that take, down. I'll text you yeah, Emma Stern, Emma T. Stern. Okay, cool. Painter. Um, dude, I got a role. No Is worries. Yeah, um, I guess one last question. What advice would you give to young artists, young entrepreneurs, uh, who are who are trying to make a difference in the world? Um, listen to your heart um, and follow that all the way through because what you create is, will make a difference in the world. It doesn't have to be a fancy nonprofit like Save Art Space. It just has to come from your authentic place. So nice. That's all I want to say. And I, I have to go now. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank you so much for coming on, man. And. Um, Dude, it's an honor. Please send me the video to this or whatever you post it. I want to share it or whatever. Yeah, it's just going to be audio. I have, I have like kind of an old computer, so it's hard for it to like process video and stuff. But um, cool. send yeah. me what you got. I'll share it. Sweet man, I really appreciate you, and um, we'll catch you next time. Thank you everyone for listening. Check the show notes for everything. Save art space and, and submit to save art space, especially you. I would love to see your art on billboard. I, I I did actually. Uh, the one in Denver that just closed, I I did that. Do the LA one because that one was more for photographers. Okay. But uh, dude, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Justin. Have a great day, man. Tune in next week for even more riveting episodes.